Hello, this is the fifth video in a little mini series that I'm calling Basic Limit Theorems. And here we're going to look at the convergence and distributions and the and characteristic functions. Um, we, we've all used Levy's Continuity Theorem before, which allows one to show convergence and distribution, you know, showing that the characteristics functions converge. Converge. It actually is a is a big time saver in many situations, but in this what what we're going to do here is we're going to look at one of the assumptions that's often overlooked. And if it's overlooked, then the theorem doesn't hold. Uh, so we'll give an example of that, and then also we're going to prove that um, that it converges uh, um, uniformly. Or that, that Fn, you know, our distribution functions converge uniformly. So let's just jump right in. So the theorem states that let's let F of n be a sequence of distribution functions and F be a distribution function. Let uh, phi of n and phi of uh, be the corresponding characteristic functions of Fn and F respectively. Then um, uh, part one says if the distribution functions converge at all the continuity points of F, then the characteristic functions converge. Okay, and now to go backwards, we we do this. If if the uh, if our characteristic functions of our sequence converges, you know, uh, to a function say g of t, which is continuous at t at zero. Okay, look at that assumption there. We're going to come back to that. Then g is a characteristic function, so it converges to g, and it's a characteristic function. And if f is the corresponding distribution function, then fn converges to f at all continuity points of f. Now we're going to omit the proof here um, and just give an example. Okay, so the assumption that function g of t is continuous at t equals zero is essential. And here's a, an example why. So let's let um, let's let's let f, x n be normal distributed with variance n. Okay. So its characteristic function you can easily show that it's e to the minus t squared n over two. So um, then uh, the characteristic functions converge to some. Um, function g of t and which is basically it converges to zero right so as this goes to infinity this gets smaller 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 okay when t is not zero that is then it goes to zero but if, if t is zero this is zero which makes this one it converges to one okay so note that g is not continuous at t Okay, so now let's look at the distribution functions. So uh, cap f of x n is, you know, by definition, is probably the x n is less than um, x. Now divide uh, square root of n to both sides because I mean, we subtracted the mean divided by the standard deviation. So this is a standard normal. So that means it's uh, phi of this. But as n goes to infinity, this goes to, to a half. Right, the, the um, CDF of at, at at zero is a one half. This is for all x. So the limiting distribution is one half, which is not a distribution function of a random variable. Right, so it doesn't apply here. And the reason was because g is not continuous at t equals zero. So anyway, so this is a, a little quick example to show you that you have to be careful when you use Levy's continuity theorem. Um, now, to prove uh, uh, this theorem that f, f of n converges uh, uniformly, so let's let the sequence converge to f for all x and n r, and let f be continuous, then the convergence is uniform in x. That is, there's an epsilon greater than zero, and there exists an n which could be a function of epsilon greater than zero such that if we have little n greater than cap n, it implies that this difference is really, really small. That's for all x. So now let's look at the proof of this. Um, 
and we'll, and we'll try to go through this sort of quickly that uh, you know by definition the, the um, CDF goes to zero as X goes to negative infinity it goes to one as X goes to infinity so there so that means uh, there exists an interval say alpha and beta such that being less than alpha is less than epsilon over two and being greater than beta is, le is less than epsilon over two. But of course this CDF goes you know, less than or equal to, so you have to say one minus epsilon. And, and this is true, so the CDF you know, does something like this, it gets really close to one, and so there's, probably, there's some cutoff that that difference is really small, and since it goes to zero, there's some cutoff that, that being less than that makes it really small. And that's what we're saying. We're going to pick that alpha and beta such that being less than or greater than that is really small. So the continuity of F implies that it's uniform continuity on this interval alpha to beta. So that means that we can find a find our partition, say, of R points, you know, where the lowest is alpha and the top is beta, such that... Um, the being, you know, the difference between any of these of these points is is uh, less than epsilon over two, and this is true for all j. Now, these points aren't equal distance. You know, they don't have to be. You know, because as as the as the CDF does this, when, when we're in this range, when it gets pretty steep, these points have to be much closer to assume that this difference is less than epsilon. So these are not equal distance, just an FYI. So now we're going to come back to this point because um, this this is true from epsilon to or alpha to beta, all right. And we want to extend this, and we're going to do that in a, in, in a minute. So now that note that for each x, and we're only going to pick these partition points, the uh, this sequence converges. That was one of the assumptions. And we're going to, we're trying to show that it converges uniformly, so that implies that. In, let's just pick one of the partition points, say x j. So then there exists an an n j, you know, depending upon what point we're at, greater than zero, such that being greater than that cap n, that this difference is really small. And now that is true for any point we pick. Now these points here may differ depending upon what point we pick. So let's just take the biggest of them. That ensures that they're all going to be less than epsilon. So if we take n to be the maximum of all these little uh, uh, nj's, then this difference is small for any of those points, that, any of these partition points. Okay. So, so we're going to remember this too. Now again, this is we've only shown it true for the partition points from alpha to beta. So now what we want to try to do is extend it. So let's let x0 be negative infinity and xr be positive infinity. So that means that you know f of x0 is 0 and f of uh, x r plus 1 is 1. Um, and so the difference between, remember this is cap f, between uh, x1 and 0 is less than epsilon and we can also say that uh, f of x r plus 1 minus of this difference is less than small because that, that's the way we picked alpha and beta that that this you know being greater than that it's really small so that's what this reference represents and this too being less than alpha which is this point is really small um, so now we want to expand the alpha in the or the uh, asterisk and double asterisk and so um, the way we defined uh, x0 and xr, now we can say that this difference between our cap f is small for any point, any of the points on the number line. And and actually this is also true for any of these points. And it's we showed it as true without adding the, the two points here, but it, it's trivially true when we when say 0, when you plug in negative infinity to both sides, it's zero, 0 minus 0, which is 0, which is less than that. And if you plug in infinity to both of those, you get 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, which is always less than alpha. So it's sort of trivially true. Okay, so now let's let um, the, pick an x in R. Then x is between 
two uh, partition points. It could equal, you know, if it equals one of them, then we'll set it up, you know, so pick the point that's larger. But it, it's probably more likely between the two. And so this is for some uh, J, you know, any, any X we pick is going to be between two of the partition points. So now let's let N be greater than cap N. And this N is is that the maximum of all those little NJs. So this is a bit, you know, this is pretty big. Then um, we're going to look at an inequality here, but I also want to spend a little time on it. If we just look at this piece here, then if we take this to there and subtract there, then that difference is less than alpha over 2. We define that. And plus, the N is greater, you know, large enough that makes this true. Okay, so now from from uh, uh, the next inequality, from here to here, if you pick a point that's a little bit bigger, then since the f of n is monotonic, this has to be bigger. And then you increase it again, then it has to be bigger. So those, you know, the way we define this, these these are trivially true. Now this next step, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore this and pretend like this point is over here you know, because it's supposed to be strong. And then if we subtract that to this side, which says f of n is minus f at, you know, the j at any point is less than epsilon over 2. We just showed that, so that's true. Now to go from here to here, um, oh, we also just look at this inequality. So if you subtract alpha... Uh, epsilon over 2 here you get epsilon over 2 and then if you subtract that back the difference between xj and xj plus 1 is less than epsilon over 2 so this relationship does hold and then here you know we're, we're going to pick a point an x that's a little bit bigger so of course this has to get bigger and then if we pick another put in a bigger x there then of course that has to get bigger so this is true so this string of inequalities is true and we're going to borrow that in just a second. So, um, hence, this is true. <laughs> so, so again, if we cover this up, well, we don't have to, yeah, I'd like to cover it up. So, the f of x plus epsilon is here, okay? And if we subtract off something smaller than this, so this is big, this is smaller, then it has to be greater than zero. So, that's true. Right, so now if we look at this piece here, so this is x n, f of n x, which is here, right, and we're subtracting off a, a number, whatever it is. Now, if we subtract off something that is uh, a little bit smaller than this, say that piece here, so if we put this in place of that, then that made this bigger, okay. And that's what this piece here is, okay? But here, we um, we put something even bigger here. We put that. We put that bigger here, and then we put something bigger that we subtract off. So it has to get bigger. And then, by definition, um, this minus that is less than epsilon over 2. And then if we take epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 plus epsilon, we get this, okay? So now let's look at our original inequality. This is less than that. So let's take this p, the epsilon, and subtract it over here. So that means that we get this, that f of n minus f is less than epsilon. And thus, for all n greater than cap n, we get that this relationship is always less than epsilon for any x that we pick. And that's the definition of uh, uniform continuous. Well, I'm running long on time, so I'm going to end it here. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, please like it and, and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Now, the next video, we're going to look at the central limit theorem and some of its applications, and then we're going to jump into the law of large numbers. All right, see you in the next one. Bye.